Praise the Lord, IPC Hebron. How's everybody doing? Great. This is the biggest crowd I think I've seen in the last year here on Sunday. Thank the Lord that uh, he is uh, bringing a closure to this pandemic. I know that uh, we still have to be careful and we're meeting as uh, cell groups or group area groups for now. You know, um, we've been studying from the book of Acts and we're in Acts chapter 10 and 11. As you're going there, as a way of introduction, we know that the Great Commission at the end of the Gospels spoke loud and clear. In Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, it clearly says, Now, wherever you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to faithfully follow all that I have commanded you. And never forget that I am with you every day, even to the completion of this age. Luke, the beloved physician, the author of the book of Acts, reminds us again in chapter 1, verse 8, that right before the ascension, Jesus reminded his disciples once again, but you shall receive power, and when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, but not just there, but to the ends of the earth. In order for this to happen, God had to teach the apostles, the disciples, to overcome their prejudices, to overcome their ceremonial law preconceptions, and the great commission that was echoed in the ears for now about seven years had gone uh, to some fruition, but had not been to a complete fruition yet. They had taken the gospel to Jerusalem, which was where they were. They waited, and the Holy Spirit came down upon the people, waited on the day of Pentecost. We know that from the portions we've studied up to chapter 10, that it went to Judea, and then Philip the evangelist took it to Samaria, and uh, they were speaking the gospel to other Jews, but it never broke out of the circle of Jewish people. All of the Christians in the first century church that belonged to the church were people that were converts from the Jewish faith. So uh, according to the Old Testament, they had reasons to maybe follow those things. They were called out to be a separate people with a peculiar set of laws and customs. So can you fault them for trying to be so insular or being so ethnocentric? But in order for the great commission to be fulfilled, the good news of the gospel did not need to just stop with the Jewish people, but it needed to be spread to all nations, not just the nation of Israel. And there had to be some clear boundaries, some uh, things that needed to be broken, some barriers that needed to be shattered, some mindsets that needed to be changed, some customary laws that needed to be erased. We have a human tendency to know, not go outside of our comfort zones. If left to our own devices, we like to do the same things over and over again. Think about your life, you know, when you go to school or when, with your family or your social interaction. You like to stay in the people that you know. It's a little bit of uh, pain to go outside of your circle, to go outside of your comfort zone. And Peter, likewise, and the rest of the Jews did not want to leave their familiar ethnocentric Jewish ways that they were so used to and they were taught growing up. But God needed to teach them a lesson that God is a welcoming God, that he does not show any favoritism, and he seeks uh, those who diligently seek him, and he wants to make himself known to these people. Uh, whoever would seek the Lord, he is there even today to meet you where you are. If there's anybody listening that does not know the Lord Jesus and you are, are earnestly seeking him, he wants to meet with you as well. Today I'd like to speak to you on a sermon called Barriers Broken. And it'll be from Acts, all of chapter 10, which Justin went through last uh, time we spoke on this. And then chapter 11, verse 1 through 18. In this portion, we see the story of a Roman centurion. He was part of the Italian regiment. There were 600 people in this army, and they were uh, uh, in, 
Israel. They were stationed in this place called Caesarea, and he was in charge of a hundred of them. And that story is mentioned over and over about what happened to him three times. First, we see the story narrated by Luke. Then we see in chapter 10, Cornelius repeats the story. And then when the uh, Jewish uh, leaders, the party of the circumcision asks Peter, Peter again repeats the story. So three times, the same story is repeated. And so many scripture portions are taken up in that story, repeating it over and over. Whenever the word of God repeats something over and over, there is definitely importance to that. And God wanted to tell us something. You know, the prophecy of God that was revealed in the Old Testament, Isaiah, that through his son Jesus, there would be hope for all nations, for Gentiles as well, needed to come to pass. And if the Jewish people stayed within their comfort zone, they stayed within their ethnic group, if they stayed in their, uh, uh, what was familiar to them, that could not happen. And this is a story of how the gospel broke out from the Jewish ethnocentricity and how it went into the nations. And thank God for that. This is the beginning of how each and every one of you sitting here, I don't believe any of you are Jewish, uh, can say, this is how I came to know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we see that in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. We're very familiar with it, and, and uh, Justin went through it, but I just want to point out a few important points uh, as I'm going through it one more time. So we know about the story of Cornelius. He was an important man. He was a busy man that was in charge of a hundred soldiers. He was a devout man of extraordinary character, it says. It says there's four qualities that is mentioned right away. He worshiped God, and we see later he revered God's people. He prayed regularly, and he even fasted. He had a heart for the poor, and he gave generously to help the poor. And he had the respect of his own family, and they followed him. So we see that he had many, many good qualities. But he was a Gentile. He was a Roman. He was Italian. So uh, he had not heard the gospel. He had gone, uh, grown up in the, Jewish uh, in, in the Roman tradition. And as we see later in Acts, we see that the Romans had tons of God, even a God of uh, unknown gods. Uh, so there were so many gods, and his tradition was to uh, seek after all of these other gods. But when he was stationed in, in Israel as the leader of this army, he was a devout man who was seeking the Lord. It says, uh, even though he grew up with Roman gods, he was a seeker of the true and living God. And God was willing to meet him and knew the state of his heart. The word of God says that... Uh, your, your prayers, your, your works have reached up to me, even though he was not a Christian. So important points that we, wanna, we want to uh, bring forth from here. Even though he was a man who was doing good works, there are so many people in the world that are doing good works. That does not gain you salvation. If you are praying or fasting, if you have a heart for the poor, by in itself, if you're giving generously, if you're respecting others, if you're striving by your own self, it does not gain you salvation. This man still needed to hear the gospel story of Jesus. And we see that God was orchestrating things in the background. So point number one I wanted to make, and this is very um, simple, but I, I, I feel like uh, we need to have some clarity on this, that salvation is by faith in Jesus alone, not by any of our works or our striving. If we see in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one can boast. If it was based on the good works, then we could boast that I did this, I did that, and that's why I am saved. But no, it is none of that. And we see examples of that over and over in the Bible. That it is only by the redeemed work of the Lord Jesus on the cross and believing on him and confessing him and following him with all our heart and not by any of our works that we are saved. We are saved for good works, but we are not saved by our works. 
Amen? And so we see that grace alone saved us. Nothing that we did could earn our salvation. And it is a love, free gift of the Lord. And that uh, if you trust in him, anybody listening to me, if you trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior and you believe in him, confess him with your mouth and decide to follow after him, you can be a child of God. And it is only by believing in the Lord Jesus, not anything of your heritage, not anything that you are born into, not anything of your works that you can earn salvation. Point number two that I'd like to make here is that if you're earnestly seeking the truth, the living God, he will pursue you. In James it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It says, so uh, do you have a heart, even if you don't know and your heritage may not be of Christian background, it may not be of knowing the true and living God, do you have a heart that is seeking after the truth? Are you a true seeker of the word of God? And if that is the case, the Lord sees him. Even though he was not a Christian yet, the Lord had seen him and orchestrated things so that he can learn about the Lord Jesus. The story of Cornelius goes on, and God orchestrates things through supernatural arrangements. We know that Cornelius had a visitation from an angel in Caesarea with specific instructions for him. And then Peter, at the same time the next day, had a vision of a linen tablecloth uh, in Joppa at Simon the Tanner's rooftop. And how, it is amazing how God is orchestrating a heart that is seeking after him. He sees everyone, every human, and the hearts and the intentions. And if you're truly seeking him, he will orchestrate things for you. And he will uh, uh, give the good news of the gospel to you. But before that, need, that gospel was speak, uh, spoken, there had to be some change in the mindset of the early century Christians, the disciples, the apostles, Peter. So there was a linen tablecloth that was uh, uh, put out, and it said, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And there were all types of animals. And he says, no, my, my, my no means Lord. See, that's an oxymoron right there. If you are calling someone Lord, that means that you will obey what they say. But Peter, classic to himself, is saying, no, no. Uh, and he's saying Lord at the same time. If Lord is, if, if he is truly Lord, you will obey what he says. But God, he still needed to work on him. And he had to do it three times over and over and say, don't call what I have called holy unclean. Don't call what I have called holy unclean. Three times again, just like the story here, three times God had to work on Peter to change his mindset. And Peter was still confused at the end. And he saw the three men and the Lord had to say, go with them without any hesitation. And we see that Peter was uh, willing to go with him and obey the Lord. And he was able to enter in the Gentile's house and eat with them. And we see in that portion, he says, you know, I'm not supposed to do this, right? I'm not supposed to go into the house of a Gentile. I'm not supposed to eat with a Gentile, but I will obey what the Lord has taught me. I will obey what the Lord is trying to work through me. We have many customs. We have many traditions. They come from a good place, I believe. And our forefathers uh, had uh, uh, the right reasoning for some of those, and the Lord might have spoken to him. But our standard is in the living word of God. And if the word of God says to go, if the Lord says that all people are equal, then there is no more holding on to prejudices, no more holding on to preconceptions. The Lord is working on Peter just as much. You know, Philip was in Samaria, which was closer, but God had to work on Peter for there to be an outpouring of the spirit, an outpouring of the gospel to all of the nations. Point number three that salvation is for all human beings through Jesus, that there is no racism with God. We know how we can earn salvation, but that all humankind, regardless of your race, regardless of your creed, regardless of your financial situation, regardless of your age, if you believe in the Lord Jesus, there is no racism with our God. For in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, it says, that through Jesus, that he had provided a way and God shows no partiality. 
and that God does not show undue favor or unfairness. With him, there is no man that is different from one another. And again, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, it says, God has shown me and taught me that I should never view anyone inferior or ritually unclean. This was their teaching for decades. This, was their, this is what they were taught. But God was blowing their mind and teaching them something new that is in the New Testament, that is in the New Covenant, that we should not consider anyone inferior based upon the color of their skin, based upon their background, based upon their education. We are all equal before the Lord. We are all children of God, and all of us have equal access to the Lord, by believing in the Lord Jesus for our salvation. Point number four is there is, uh, you know, this is, this is a, you might think it's a, it's a funny thing that we got the meats, like the Arby's saying, we got the meats. The victory food came through this experience. You know, the Jewish tradition said you cannot have pigs in a blanket or you can't have any bacon. Thank God that the Lord changed this here, right? Is there any witnesses? Come on, I know you guys eat sausage and bacon. But the Lord was trying to teach something far better. It was not just about food. He was trying to teach Peter a spiritual meaning that anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus, it doesn't matter what they're eating. It doesn't matter the custom or the culture that there is victory through the Lord Jesus and that the Lord Jesus was the great equalizer and that he, anyone who believes on the Lord Jesus, and this is the prophecy I was referring to in Isaiah chapter 42 verse 1 that we learned about on Friday. Behold my servant, behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. In order for this prophecy in Isaiah 42 chapter uh, verse 1 to be fulfilled, there had to be this experience of Cornelius the Italian. And there had to be the change in the mindset of Peter. Amen. We know that Peter then starts to go into the good news of the gospel. And that is seen in verse 34 all the way to verse 42. And in the midst of the sermon, the Holy Spirit comes down. He says the true gospel to this Gentiles for the first time. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, he said. But in every nation, everyone who fears him, and does what is right and acceptable to him, uh, he is able to save. Preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all, it says. And in verse 38, it says, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good, healing all of the oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Verse 39 says, they put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him on the third day and made him appear so Jesus was brought to them in the true, simplest gospel message that Jesus, who was there in the beginning, took the form of a man, came down into the earth, uh, to the earth to be the bridge for mankind, and that he died and three and a half, uh, three, three, he ministered for three and a half years and three days after his death that he resurrected and he lives on the right side of the Father for anyone, anyone all nations to believe on the Lord Jesus and they will be saved. So the ethnic barriers were shattered once and for all. Cornelius invites all of his relatives and his intimate friends and says, come on in, come on in, come on in. Peter shares the true gospel to that entire large group and the Gentile Pentecost has finally arrived. We learned about Pentecost on, in Acts chapter 2 but the Gentiles were not included in that. But now there is us included. A Gentile Pentecost happened in that place. And in the midst of the hearing of the word, before Peter was done with his sermon, there was the power of the living God that came down upon people like us, the non-Jews. And there was a second Pentecost, a Gentile Pentecost that took place among an entire group, the Cornelius family, the relatives, and his friends. And Peter uh, we see, says, you know, if the Holy Spirit comes down upon this group of people, who am I to block them from getting baptized? And we see that entire family gets baptized. And we see 
the work of the Lord taking place. You know, Peter had to take a lot of heat for this because the people that were the Jews, uh, that were the circumcision group in chapter 11, we see that even before Peter spent some days with them after they were baptized and was encouraging them, but before he got back to Jerusalem, word got back that he ate with the uncircumcised people. Pastor, how many of you know that if you're doing the right thing sometimes, there is going to be criticism. There is going to be people that stand against the true and living word. There is going to be people that will say, uh, why did you do that? That's not our custom. You know, that's not, that's not what we do. But if it says in the word and if the Lord has said it, then there is truth to it. And Peter, he doesn't get angry. He has a defense. And he, in humility, says, it is not my personal opinion, folks. It is the wisdom of God's word that is said through the prophets. And when the, well, I had taken six witnesses, I think Justin mentioned it, the six Jewish witnesses, um, in chapter 11 it says it was six, and they bore witness of everything that happened. And in a systematic way, Peter was able to defend himself and say, this is all God. God backed up by the wisdom of God's word and God's authority. And he was able to win over even the people that were against him. And now the entire Jewish crowd understands the gospel is not just for them. We're not just a special group of people that there is uh, uh, Christians from all nations that need to take place. So the Great Commission can now truly be fulfilled. There is going to be people that come from Africa, uh, from Asia, from all cont continents of the world that can believe on the Lord Jesus and uh, believe that he is the one, the only way to be uh, saved. So we see that Peter had to defend himself back in Jerusalem to the circumcision group. But once they got the real story, they had no defense either. Amen. Amen. So we see and learn many things that all are welcome to God. It doesn't matter if you're a half-breed Samaritan. It doesn't matter if you're a Philippian jailer. It doesn't matter if you're a violent criminal suffering the death penalty in prison. It doesn't matter wherever you are in your workplace. There are people going through so many things. They might not look like you. They might not speak like you. They might have an accent. They might have a different color skin tone. But all are welcome to God. Amen. How much clearer could it be that God made this, that the gospel is for everyone, every tribe, every tongue, uh, every people, nation, nation group, every status, every color, every socioeconomic class, everyone, whatever your background, it does not matter. You are welcome in God's kingdom. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37, the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. And we learned that in this story. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. In Romans chapter 10, it says that there is no distinction, worship team, come on up, between the Jews and the Greeks. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches in all for all those who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And we all know the most famous word in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the whole world, not just part of the world, not just certain races, but the whole world. He gave his only begotten son that you can put your name and says, God so loved me that I am welcome in the kingdom of God and that God was able to break some ethnic barriers. So whoever you are. If you're a child here, you need, all you need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus and he is able to, he is able to uh, redeem you. You know, there are only two kinds of people, and I was seeing this last night, coincidentally, Leonard Ravenhill said this, there are only two kinds of people in this world. There are only two kinds, not black or white, not rich or poor, but those who are either dead in their sins without Jesus or those who are dead to sin by believing on the Lord Jesus. Those are the only two groups of people. You know, it might seem harsh to the world out there now, 
that Jesus Christ, you might seem intolerant, is the only way. It does not allow a second means of salvation, and he is the only way, he is the only truth. And he died on the cross, took upon the sins of all those who will ever believe on him, the elect of the Lord, by faith, and he was punished in our place. He bore the pain for us. He took on the pain for us. And all, amen, all nations need to hear this news. Amen. I know we're doing our part in world missions and through the word of God that is also reaching in this pandemic time around the world. People listening to sermons and other things. The word of God is reaching many, many places. And I thank the Lord for that. But in your, in your workplace, in your school, there might be friends and they might look different. They might not look like you. They might not have the same skin color or accent. But all nations, all people are important to God. Let's tell others about the good news of the gospel. And may the Lord bless you with these words.